Hey y'all. As you might know, I have not done a vlog in quite a while. Um, I don't exactly re Oh, right, yeah, there was, there was a whole, uh, weird boycott thing on Monday and Tuesday, which I participated in. I was not on Instagram or, uh, Twitter. Um, I will be completely honest, I did sign in a couple times just to see, uh, if... Just mostly by habit. Um, but, uh, I honestly, I have no idea if that actually accomplished anything. Uh, I guess the numbers are still in. Not very many people have written articles about it. Um, so, we'll see. But the plus side of that was that I was able to, to get uh, quite a bit of things done. Um, I was more productive, I think. And I think, I'm hoping to continue that productivity. And one of the major important things... Um, apart from my writing, which I'll talk about at the, uh, after, um, is the, the series where I talk about my, actually, it is about my writing to an extent, I talk about the nations in my fantasy world. Um, I use the word nations rather than race, because race, the term, has quite a colored history, uh, aging back to slavery and Nazism, where they would use it to uh, divide people, so I think it's a divisive, um, term. I don't, I don't uh, advocate the use of the word race when you're really talking about nations and cultures and eth eth ethnicities and things like that. So, so far I've made two videos. The first is the, um, the video on the Soldoon, and the second is the video on the um, Antarial, or the North Match. What I would like to do ne uh, for my third video is the East Match. And then we'll talk about the Lusa Jab and other uh, groups. Now I've made one, I've made two videos actually on on this topic, talking about each one generally, and I think it's kind of boring. Um, so I'm not going to do that in this video. What I what I will say is that um, they're mostly humanoid. Uh, some of them have special powers, like the ability to control their adrenaline rushes. Um, and uh, fire lasers out of their eyes, but um, just because they're more uh, adept and more skilled at doing these <laughs> um, somewhat unusual things doesn't mean that they're special. In fact, um, anybody can learn, can train themselves with to, uh, to use these abilities. Um, similar to how we aren't all able to run a marathon by default, but it turns out that humans are actually um, capable of learning to run a marathon the same way that we are capable of, say, learning to read. It's something that pretty much everybody can do, um, but you ca you can't do it right off the bat. But you can learn it pretty much universally. And that's how I have pretty much all, um, nearly all things in, in my fantasy setting is realistic in this sense, where there's no special people, there's no chosen ones, um... If they're special, it's probably because of, like, birth or status or something like this, not because of some sort of innate ability, because I really... I think in real in the real world, we all have some sort of uh, degree of individual uniqueness. And I think that that's good enough. I don't think we need to have some sort of special power to accompany that. For example, there have been a lot of talented sports uh, people um, across, you know, many, many decades but certain people are standing out, not be not only because of their sportsmanship, but because um, because they're they're friendly people. They donate to charities. Um, they're part of activist groups. So talent isn't enough. And I think that in writing, um, I I believe that to be the case as well. So I don't include. Sorry, I do actually include because it kind of happens accidentally. Um, the, the sort of chosen one, but um, at the end of the day, the chosen one isn't the only one. For example, um, the protagonist of The Stolen Prince, which you should totally check out. I'm aware that um, all these calls to action in my Instagram videos are utterly failing because uh, nobody has bothered to check out my website in the last month. Now. It may sound like I'm complaining, and that's because I absolutely am, damn it. <laughs> so, um, now, I've been, I've been pushing content onto that uh, blog for about three years, 
uh, quite a lot of it is fairly good, and that's not by my own opinion, that's because um, uh, a lot of it has gone into portfolios which have gotten me accepted into university programs with small class sizes, meaning that I'm one of the uh, chosen few who actually get in. Um, but there is a sort of, I recognize a mismatch between the content on my website and what I talk about in these vlogs. Um, and so I, I sort of want to bridge that gap. I, want, I, don't I don't know if I want to necessarily talk about writing, but I think a more universal and a uh, more interesting topic would be to talk about um, stories, storytelling. Because uh, everybody loves stories. Um, you know, movies and things like, and TV shows and things like this are, are universal pastimes. And why is this so slippery? Anyway, um, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of making supper here. So, um,. I, I happen to know quite a lot about storytelling, and I happen to know quite a lot about um, archetypes, um, narrative structure. Um, basically, there was a strain in, I would say, the early modernist period and the late um, Greco-Roman period. The, uh, the great Aristotle himself is thought to have started this sort of discipline. And then it became sort of dormant. Nobody talked about it for a long time. I'm talking about structuralism. And then um, a great Canadian uh, literary genius, um, not in the sense that he wrote literary masterpieces, but rather that he uh, wrote one of the texts that, one of the greatest texts for analyzing it using a structural approach was uh, Northrop Frye. The problem was, is that Northrop Frye was writing during an era of, well, our, what some might call our current era, postmodernism, where they reject the idea that there is any sort of grand narrative in the real world. They were all sort of fragmented, um, ironic. Um, you see this uh, actually reflected in a lot of modern uh, television and movies, where um, at the end of the day, is there a, is there a greater message is there an overarching theme? Usually there isn't, or if there is, it's undermined by something. Um, I'd love to give it examples, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. But, um, oh, for example, you know, shows like Seinfeld. That was a long time running, very successful uh, sitcom, which wasn't trying to push any moral. And you might say, well, you know, almost nothing does, and that's right. In the postmodern era, almost nothing does. But back in the day, things like uh, shows like I Love Lucy, I, I watched a couple episodes, and Star Trek, they were probing for some sort of grand... Star Trek was probing for some sort of grand overarching meaning. To an extent, Stargate was uh, it had a lot of moral issues and how do we deal with inter intergalactic trade. Um, and then um, and Atlantis with the... the um, the fact that there was this this giant universal threat um, of the Wraith and the people from Earth, the Stargate Atlantis people, didn't have enough resources to save everybody. And so what do you do? Do you let them die? Do you try and help them fight back the Wraith? There's so many moral quandaries to cover. But other shows have none of this, right? Um, and we're seeing a renaissance of, of the meaning, oh, I'll just touch on I Love Lucy. In I Love Lucy, they sort of, uh, the first episode, they sort of, the wives prank the husbands, and the husbands prank the wives, and at the end of the day, they're like, oh, you know what? Um, we ended up spending time with each other anyway, regardless of all this. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember it perfectly, but there was clearly some sort of, um, some sort of dilemma. The, the main characters were making some sort of clear, obvious mistake, which they end up remedying at the end of the show. And so I'm not saying, you know, oh, you need some sort of uh, ultra-moralizing, um, philosophical or theological message in every single um, story or movie or book you watch. But what I am saying is that there should be some sort of growth. There should, should be some sort of reason why um, the watcher, the viewer, should come out from that narrative on the other side, knowing a little bit more either about themselves or about um, their journey in life and what they should be doing. So, 
why am I talking about this? Oh, okay, right. So, Northrop Fry was a structuralist, and I'm able to approach texts from a structuralist perspective, not because I've read Northrop Fry, but because uh, one of my professors has, and he's taught us structuralism according to Northrop Fry um, in, I think, at least three courses. So, a great example of this. Um, let's try and uh, let's try and cover something familiar. Okay, so we've all heard of maybe you've heard of the hero's journey. Um, shows like Star Wars or movies, sorry, like Star Wars are accused of having a hero's journey. And I'll lay it down for you. And while I'm saying this, I want you to just think of every adventure, movie, book, or to an extent, television show that you've encountered, watched, or read in your entire life. Um, think of your favorites if you don't want to compile everything you've ever read, ever. Um, so you have somebody starting off in a small town or perhaps a uh, more run-down neighborhood in a city. Okay. Now I'm thinking, okay, you've got Harry Potter, um, pretty much Anakin and Luke St Skywalker from Star Wars. Um, oh, The Hobbit. Um, what's his name? Frodo and Bilbo Baggins. Um, you're going to find pretty much every single, especially male character, starts off like this. Um, even, you know, Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Um, probably every Disney movie. Um, even, I guess you could consider Pinocchio. You know, things like this. Um, so that's step one. Then step two is that they leave their home to go on some sort of quest. Maybe they're forced out. You remember the Lion King? He ran away. Um, in Tales of Symphonia, my favorite game ever, he wanted to leave. But then the Chosen's party moved on without him. But then he ended up getting exiled from his village for, um, well, bringing enemies in. But um, he went on, he started his, his journey by leaving his hometown. Belle gets locked away with the beast. Um, you know, Pinocchio runs away uh, or something. He goes to the carnival or something. Um, you know, all the Star Wars films, the kid leaves in the first movie. Um, Harry Potter leaves to go off to Hogwarts. Um, you, you see that um, J.K. Rowling will re uh, 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 repeat, or I almost want to say backwash, this same narrative uh, to really pull out our instincts because archetypes are f found in all sorts of literature because they pull out our instincts. But this is the hero's journey. So they go out into the world. They meet some sort of mentor. Um... For Harry, it was Dumbledore. For the Hobbits, it was Gandalf. For, um... Uh, well, you get the point. Oh, yeah, right. Obi-Wan Kenobi, come on, right? Um, and then... Um, then they go out on their quest. They, they usually go to some sort of underworld sort of place, um... For, for Frodo, this was going to Mordor, right? Um, for, for Bilbo, it was going into the Dragon's Lair. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, you get the point. And so they, they, they fight some sort of abstracted chaos. And this is usually uh, personified in a dragon, if you think about fairy tales, or even just um, the Hobbit. Um, or it could be a Death Star. Right? Some sort of abstracted threat. Um, it, it can be a psychological threat, like an existential threat in... Oh my gosh, what was that? It was the Marvel... Um, the, the Netflix series that wasn't Daredevil. Anyway, the bad guy had some sort of psychological power. Um, and then they, they succeed and they come home with some sort of riches or knowledge from their quest. That's the hero's journey. That's what Northrop Fry would call a romance. There's also comedies, tragedies, and ironies. Seinfeld has no narrative arc, so it's considered an irony. Good ending, that's a comedy. A bad ending, that's a tragedy. There's no escape from these. You can only have those three endings, kind of a mixed good or bad. I'm going to end it there, but I think that applying this sort of approach to uh, stories or just explaining the raw theory could be fascinating, and I might start doing that in later videos. This is Daniel Triumph signing off. Hope to see you next time. Check out DanielTriumph.com, linked in my bio, and Daniel L. Triumph on Twitter.